All right, so we've talked about some conservation laws before. Um, one of them being the conservation of energy. And the other being the conservation of linear momentum. Um, conservation of energy said that if no uh, external work was done, energy was conserved. The conservation of linear momentum said that if no impulses were applied, uh, impulses force times the, the, the amount of time that force is acting on, over acting over, if no impulse is applied externally to the system or the body, that we have a conservation of linear momentum. And uh, we use this for collisions and stuff a lot. Um, M1, V1 initial, plus M2, V2 initial, one V one final plus M two V two final. Right? And for however many particles we have, uh, typically we're supposed to. Um, sometimes we could be working an explode exploding problem where it's one that turns into two, or we could have something like a ballistic pendulum where it's two that turns into one. In that case, they moved off at the same final velocity. Right? Plus M2. <clears throat> okay, um, well, guess what? We have a conservation of angular momentum too. And um, we're not going to get too deep in the derivation of it, but basically, for linear momentum, we could have no external impulses applied to the system. If we had a force acting for some amount of time, it either sped up or slowed down or changed the direction of the system, right? Um, well, the same thing goes here. Um, we cannot apply any external torques. <clears throat> so let's say we have some mass spinning like this. Um, an external torque would be like if I applied a force out at the edge, some distance r. Well, if there is no forces acting on this, then it's going to just keep spinning. So if it has some omega initial, it's going to just keep spinning at that same omega forever, um, unless there's a like imagine being in space, no forces, gravity is not even acting on you, or you could be in free fall around Earth, so it's like no no forces are acting on you just because of the free fall part. Um, if you took anything and just spun it, it's just going to sit there and keep spinning, just like uh, satellites and stuff, uh, or the Apollo modules. They spin as they travel from the Earth to the Moon. It not only helps track their direction using gyroscopes and gimbals, but it also uh, provides stability. And it also, if this is the Sun, here's your Apollo capsule traveling this direction. Um, you can't just cook one side the whole time and let one side have the pull to space. So, uh, it just travels at a constant linear momentum, unless acted upon by some gravitational force in this case. And it spins and just keeps spinning. Its angular momentum is conserved. Now we can say that um, for a particle or for a system, as long as the change in momentum with respect to time is zero, that means that the angular momentum is constant. So at some final state versus some, or some initial state versus some final state, um, the angular momentum is going to be equal. Now, it can start spinning faster, 
Omega initial can be different. Omega final can be different than Omega initial, the angular velocity. And there's a couple reasons for this. But first, the conservation law says that if there's no external torque acting, so no external torque. Because remember, we just had a definition that said that the torque is equal to the time rate of change of angular momentum with respect to time. If this is equal to zero, then this has to equal zero too, right? That means the angular momentum is constant, constant, and we can say the, the linear momentum in its initial state is equal to the angular momentum in its final. Sorry, I keep mixing angular and linear. So um, P denotes linear momentum, and L, in this case capital L, because we're talking about the whole system, would be our angular momentum. Sorry if I confused you. Um, if there's no net external torque or no forces acting at a distance, then the angular momentum does not change. We can also write this as I omega is equal to the final state for I omega. <clears throat> So that's the moment of inertia times the angular velocity. And uh, the reason this is a good definition is because I said omega can change, right? I'll give you a simple example. Um, I drew a pickle instead of a person. Um, let's say we have someone, let's put their arms out extended and they're spinning. If they have some initial omega or angular velocity, and all they do is pull their arms in, omega final is going to be greater than omega initial. All they did was change the moment of inertia about their body. They changed the mass distribution, and therefore it causes them to spin faster. And it does seem um, we can relate that to R and B is equal to R and B. If we're looking at, say, they had a circular path of their arms. Initially, R was R1. Let's say, call R initial is greater than R final. R final comes in much smaller, right? Um, they, they took mass and as far as you could put your arms out and they brought it in close to the body. And the closer you bring that mass in, the faster you can start spinning. So they didn't add, they didn't provide any torque, they didn't do anything. This is still a system, right? Nothing nothing pushed it, nothing touched it, nothing did anything. They're losing some spin down here. Um, due to friction when they're rotating, but uh, we can ignore that for now. But you might have seen that this might be a little more dramatic or possibly easier for a figure skater versus a ballerina because there's less friction there. They can spin pretty dang fast. But um, if we use this right here, we need to really denote R1 mv1 is equal to R2 mv2 because that radius can change right uh, let's do another example uh you can this one's in your book you could have a person sitting their feet on a stool and this whole thing is on some sort of platform that can spin and let's say they have their arms out with some heavy dumbbells Right, this mass is equal to this mass, and as it 
it rotates about this axis with some omega, these both move in a circular path. An identical circular path, as long as your arms are the same, right? Um, they have tangential velocities like this. And they would have some initial arm stretch or position to create. Now if you bring your arms in where the dumbbells are closer, like that, um, you're going to see omega final is much bigger. Doesn't matter how much time took place. It's a conservation law. We don't, know. We don't care about this. Now. Just the position of a person's arms. That distributed the mass more differently. Um, just think this is kind of like uh, spinning. If these were very heavy, this would be like spinning a. a a solid cylinder about this axis. Now imagine spinning that same thing, but it's more like this. <clears throat> You're spinning it about this axis. Um, since this has mass distributed out here further, and it also has mass out here in the middle, it's not going to want to spin as fast. They're going to have the same angular momentum though, so angular momentum at 1 is going to be equal to angular momentum at 2, and that is our conservation law. Conservation of angular momentum. <clears throat> now your book has a couple other examples that are pretty good actually. Um, one is a diver, but I'm not going to draw it too detailed. But basically their center of mass takes a parabolic path, and when they first jump, they might jump straight up like that. Once they get to the top, maybe they're bending down a little bit and they're going into a front flip so their head starts dropping. Now they get through a whole front flip, something like that. They keep rotating. And then you have to extend to slow your rotation down. So, here's the body, here's the legs, here's your head. Starting to open up and extend so that before you hit the water, you are in a vertical position. Something like that. Um, throughout this whole process, the only thing that changed was the distribution of the mass of the diver's body. They just moved their arms and legs in certain positions, and by doing so, they were able to change the rate at which they were spinning. No forces or torques were applied. Um, angular momentum is conserved just by distributing the mass differently. They were able to change in the in this case, and they go is in that direction, right? <clears throat> um, the other example in your book is of a runner doing a uh, long jump. And when you jump, it might look something like this, but when you land, the whole point is to get your feet out as far as possible. Like that. Because the distance measured is where your feet hit and leave a mark in the sand. So to do so, you can control the motion of your body by doing just such, by controlling the mass distribution using your arms, your legs, even your head. Right? Um, there's a nice ballerina example too, but it's a complicated move I don't really want to draw. Um, something like this for one leg down and one leg up and arm 
and uh, something like this. And they jump into the air. And since this leg is already up, they're able to do like a sideways looking spin, but their axis of rotation is still actually like this. But here's their head, arms up over their body, and their legs are both pointed back this way. So as the performer ascends, outstretched leg is brought down <clears throat> and the other is brought up. So one comes down and the other comes up. Equal amounts also, some angle theta. And by doing so, you get a real graceful motion and it increases the rotation because the these masses are pretty stretched out to start with, and then you're bringing them real close together. All right, so this distance is very small now. And if we're rotating, then it's going to increase the angular velocity, omega. So once again, there's a couple different ways. R1 and V1 is equal to R2 and V2. But then you can always relate angular velocity to linear velocity by v is equal to r omega. And in that case, it, we end up reducing to i omega initial, or at 1, is equal to i at 2 